Between 8-12% of the body weight of a horse is blood, okay? So an average 500 kilo horse, she will have about 40 litres of blood. It's when you find your horse in the field or in the stable and has a wound and you see a lot of blood, don't panic. Stay calm and relax because there are not many horses that would ever die from haemorrhaging. So the artery is oxygenated blood, it's carried under a lot of pressure straight from the heart and is bright red. The deoxygenated blood that's already done its job and been around the body is slightly darker, but it's under a much lower pressure. So if you come to your horse and the blood is out shooting and literally hitting the wall, it'll go 15 foot. That is an arterial bleed, a bit more worrying. The venous one is more of a trickle. We want to stop the bleeding. We now don't really advocate tourniquet. And what we also don't want people to do is put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off. You want to apply firm pressure. Anything you have, if you're out in the field competing, hunting, whatever, sweatshirt, shirt, whatever you have, preferably something clean. If you're at home and you have a first aid kit or something, something clean and you want to apply firm, even pressure. And put more on. Keep adding, don't take it off. And hopefully, in your other hand, you're probably phoning us does take a little bit of time for blood to clot. Wounds that we see delayed, that we should have seen earlier, are puncture wounds. And that can be anywhere on the body. They're often missed, in fairness, for perhaps 24, 48 hours. And particularly in the winter when you've got sort of shaggy horses and something that isn't grey but is dark bay, so you're not going to see the blood. And then the first sign that you get is perhaps a very swollen leg or a very lame horse. And the big thing that we're always worried about is obviously if they go into joints or if they go into sort of tendon sheaths or tendons or perhaps up into the foot. And again, joint fluid is literally pale straw colour. It looks like weak urine. So if you get any sort of oozing and you're sort of vaguely thinking, hang on, I think this is in a joint or perhaps it's near a joint. It's on the knee or on the hock would be a really classic one. And your horse is very lame. Could be a very small wound, but if you get this pale straw coloured liquid, it may not be synovial fluid. It can be serum, which comes out from damaged cells. And it's, it's a problem for us to establish as well as you guys. But I think if you know it's near a joint and it's a puncture wound and your horse is very sore, don't delay, just ring. Wounds below the knee and below the hock heal in a very different way to wounds that heal higher up. And the reason for that is that there's very, very little mobility of the skin lower down and there's, there's very little muscle mass. So any wound below this level is always going to take longer to heal. They heal by a process called epithelialization. And epithelialization, epithelial cells, a cell by cell by cell. So it takes quite a long time. And in, in the optimum, in the best case scenario, the skin healing would heal at about half a millimetre a day. Higher up, they heal by contraction. And this is fantastic because if, even if you had an area of skin deficit this big on this mare, 70% of that loss of skin could be um, alleviated by contraction and it literally pulls in from outside and it contracts. Granulation tissue, proud flesh, it is their mechanism for healing and they fill in the hole, the wound. It starts after probably three to six days. It looks, can bleed very quickly. Um, don't worry about the bleeding, that's quite healthy. That's, but the interesting thing is about this granulation tissue, unless it's in the foot, which is completely different, it has no nervous sensation. So the horse can't feel it. Too much granulation tissue is quite a big problem. So when we, if, if you get the granulation tissue mushrooming out over the edge of the wound, which is what happens in most cases, um, it delays the healing because we want these epithelial cells to move horizontally and if they have to sort of climb a mountain, it will delay it even more. So when we talk about perhaps cutting off the proud flesh, because they can't feel it, we just cut it off. It bleeds a lot and then we put a pressure dressing on and then we may need to repeat it if the wound is severe. And if you come and see your horse has got an eye injury, I probably wouldn't put anything in the eye at all. 
Um, eyes are phenomenally painful. If the eye is closed, if you've got some nasty discharge, if perhaps they've, you know, they've gone off their food and they're not feeling great, but also when you look at their eye, is there a cloudy surface? Sometimes we get sort of lots of eyelid lacerations and things and they need stitching back up. Horses go blind quite readily. Unlike dogs and cats and other animals, um, they've got, they're very, very sensitive with their eyes. They get something called uveitis. So an untreated eye or treated too late, you can end up with a horse that's blind in that eye. So that's the, that's the one thing I would say, try not to leave. So say, for example, she had broken her knees on the road and you put a dressing on there. Lots of things that you can do to stop the bandage dressing slipping is um, putting on some fibre G or the, the cotton ones and actually just bandaging below where you're going to bandage, just with a stable bandage. And then what it does is it just makes this lower leg a little bit fatter. So instead of everything wanting to go south, it anchors in quite firmly. So this soft band is lovely because it is so gentle and soft, it isn't gonna harm the leg. It's also very easy to sort of tear. So you're unlikely to put it on too tight. So you don't need to do anything in particular special, just lay it on. We normally overlap by about 50% of the bandage, okay? All the dressings, I think, just need to be laid on nice and flatly. You know, you sort of see people and they're sort of, putting lots of crinkles and creases in and it makes it uncomfortable. At this point in time, you could easily put on a stable bandage, something on lower down. Just a cautionary note, you don't want these dressings to get wet. You don't want them to seep through if you've got a wound that's producing an awful lot of exudate, but you also don't want to turn them out if they're going out into a small field and you, you know, and then you don't want them to have a wet bandage coming in because all that happens is you'll get contamination working its way in and taking bacteria in and then you'll end up with an infected wound. Thanks. In terms of where you bandage to and where you stop, what I find works well is if you don't put the stable bandage on before this dressing, then we could pop it on over this dressing now. So not only would it protect this, but it would also hopefully stop it from slipping. Now, she's got quite a lot of padding on here. You can also do a figure of eight on the knee and the hock. So if we were doing that, we would do the figure of eight coming down the front. And I always pull this, this, this can go on quite tight. So I always pull probably 30, 50 centimeters off and then you can lay it on. And then as you lay it on, particularly if you're on the angle, you can go so it's nice and flat and straight. And I think as long as you've got even pressure, you can anchor it a few times around the top. So at this point in time, good girl. So I would probably cut this. And then there's some E-band, which is an orange, pinky one, sorry. And you can certainly anchor it round the top. You can anchor it round the bottom. But as I say, I would probably put a stable bandage on this and then bandage round. These, um, these stable bandages, these non-stretchy ones, they're fine. The stretchy ones, if they get wet, they will constrict. Um, and sometimes we get injuries on the dock as well, on the tail. And that would be my only... The, the stretchy ones are easier to put on, but they'd be my anxiety if they get wet. Horses chewing bandages Generally, that is not normal. They're normally chewing it because it's sore underneath. So imagining that I have a dressing on here. You can take this soft band up wherever you like because it's quite soft. You can also take it round as a figure of eight. You can use cotton wool. I have to confess I absolutely hate Gamgee. Um, I don't find it, it's not very conforming, but a good roll of cotton wool or this soft band is excellent. Start off again. Once you've got your secondary layer under here, this dressing can go on a little bit more firmly. And again, I tend to unroll it. And I think as long as you're putting it on flat, 
so it hasn't got wrinkles. You don't like your dressings, do you? Mm. All right, lovely. You're all right. She says, I haven't got a wound, so I'm not entirely sure why you're bandaging me. <laughs> There are lots of sort of areas that worry us with pressure sores on horses, but the two key ones, this at the back of the knee is the accessory carpal bone. And you know, if you feel it on Rhapsody or on your own horse, there's, there's so little, it's probably three, four millimeters protecting that bone um, of skin, good girl. And then here on the hock, because we, we get so many wire wounds on horses and obviously they're always injuring here. So you've got to bandage that. But this, this is the Achilles tendon or the gastrocnemius tendon um, that runs straight down and joins on the back of the hock. And we, we need to um, bandage up over the hock for a wound here. And that, that can cause really big problems. Because again, if you have a feel of that, there's virtually no protection under it. I would always try and poultice, I mean, it, when we dig out a solar abscess, you know, I would put a little piece on virtually an inch square. Um, but I think when people are trying to find something before the vets come out, I would just try, I always pad this area with cotton wool, but I would just try and avoid soaking this area because I think you just end up with a really soggy mass. Once you've bandaged the foot up and you use this, I, uh, people do it all the time. I don't tend to just wrap it around the foot because I think you've no control on how tight it goes. Um, I tend to pull it into strips and lay it on. And if I, I always want to get two fingers down at the heels and just make sure I can get my hand, you know, my two fingers down. And I think if you can't, I don't pull it off. I just nick it round with scissors and just, uh, and just make sure that it's not getting too tight around the coronary band. I don't like seeing is where people cut a big chunk and they soak it and then the foot becomes one big soggy mess and the heels and then you end up with problems that actually weren't there um, and all they've got is perhaps a little abscess at the toe anything much higher than that you're just not going to bandage so the pulse plaster is fantastic for that yeah otherwise i always say to people clean summer sheet any time of year yeah. and j cloths Get tacking, because they're quite absorp absorptive, they're dirt cheap, and you tack it to the inside. So say, say she so had a wound there, is just, yeah. is just tack on a clean J-cloth under the rug. So instead of having to wash the rug every day, you just cut it off each day and then just tack another one on. And there's lots and lots of bits and pieces that we use here. Are something called pressage boots. Um, one for the fetlock, one for the knee, and one for the hock. And the biggest problem we have, and I sh I'm sure someone here will agree with me, is actually dressings slipping down the leg well, because we put a dressing on, we put the soft band on, which is nice and soft, and then the pressage works on a very firm, even pressure. And they are particularly useful for the knee and the hock, especially the hock. This polsterplast, you can put it on the face, you put it on a stitch up anywhere. It's been on the market quite a few years now and you just cut it to any which shape and you, you can't, you obviously don't put it onto the wounds, you put your dressing which sticks onto it exactly and then you pop it on. Sometimes it makes a bit of a gluey mess of their skin so you just surgical spirit around on the hair. Um, so literally it's just a piece of foam but it's very very sticky. The Zorbo pad or melalin is quite a cheap and cheerful dressing it's not overly absorptive but ideal for any wound that perhaps you want to manage at home advisorb or the other one um, is 
a leave-in is what we would use on any wound that we would probably go out to that's a bit nasty. So it's pink and cream, it's cream side onto the wound. I always think when this has been on a couple of days, it is quite smelly. I know that sounds obvious, but it, people think sometimes the wound's infected, it's not. I always think these go a bit smelly. Um, there are lots of different sort of permutations of this. There are bigger ones, there are ones with sticky bits around the edge. If you've got a very exudative wound, you're obviously going to call the vet. When I say exudate, I mean a wound that's producing an awful lot of dead cellular material and it can produce sort of a lot of yellow, thick discharge, which isn't actually pus. Then actually nappies are very, very absorptive and we sometimes use them on pus in the foot and foot injuries. This soft band is lovely because it is so gentle and soft, it isn't going to harm the leg. It's also very easy to sort of tear, so you're unlikely to put it on too tight. On a wound that's just occurred that perhaps you don't particularly need the vet for but you do want to bandage, um, intracyte gel. Um, you'll never do any harm with intracyte gel. It is uh, it's supposed to be a single use. There's probably only five mils in there. Flamazine, which is a silver-based cream, is superb. It's very, very good for mud fever as well. The, these creams um, you really want to be putting on in the later stages of wound, so perhaps after four or five days, once you've started to get that little bit of healing, okay? Dermasol um, speeds natural healing. This is actually very good. If we've got a lot of dead and necrotic tissue, we would often use this. The wound's very contaminated, it's full of hay or dust or whatever it's been out hunting, then that's quite good at drawing um, things out. Dermagel, um, I, what would I use Dermagel for? A very good product. I'd probably use it on an open wound that perhaps I didn't necessarily want to bandage. Um, and the same probably with flamazine. If I was bandaging a wound in the early stages, I'd use intracyte gel. Otherwise, the great thing that seems to be that we've used for years and that's finally hit the uh, medical profession is medical grade Manuka honey. So it's Activon. So it's Manuka honey. Um, Again, I wouldn't put this on a fresh wound, but once wounds have started to heal and granulate, um, it's really, really good. And unlike an awful lot of veterinary products, it's actually very, very cost effective. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a really great product. I don't think you can go far wrong with a bit of Pseudocreme and Vaseline in your first aid kit. Um, I think that works really well. I think everyone should have some duct tape um, for feet. I wouldn't use it on anything other than um, a foot problem because obviously there's absolutely no stretch in it. So. Um, saline, salt water, um, hibby scrub, it's in the first aid kit, people love it, it's actually very very irritant as is povidine iodine, it's very irritant to cells and skin if you use it neat, um, so if you're going to use it concentrated you must rinse it off otherwise dilute 1 in 50 with water um, so you literally can't even see it but um, Sterile salt water is obviously what we use, and that's great. Um, animal Lintex Poultice, for me, I'm sure everybody's different. I tend to only use it on the foot. Um, it, you know, if you've perhaps a horse has been out hunting and you think it's got a thorn somewhere, it can be quite good to sort of draw something out, perhaps on, you know, higher up the leg. But um, I do shudder a little bit when I go out and people have poulticed a wound on a leg. Um, it's not really, I don't think, very applicable. There are lots of different sized tubi grips that we use for people and these can actually be really good to um, try and prevent you know, pressure sores um, on knees or hocks.